to specialists and general audiences, our short term, more immediate goal is to inspire all of you to um, think strategically about how you put together your portfolios at the end of um, your time here at GSAP, which is a graduation requirement, as you know. Um, but a more longer term and perhaps the more important one is to provoke ways of thinking about visual presentation as a larger sort of overarching concept with some longevity, something you're going to have to contend with um, throughout the, the rest of your professional lives um, as architects and designers. So these series of events aim to help students build a successful uh, graduation portfolio while simultaneously unpacking the topics, tools, and trends of contemporary graphic design. So over uh, the next couple of days, we'll investigate the minutia of glyphs, grids, all the way up to structures and style, um, ranging from concrete concepts to perhaps more elusive ones. Um, so I want, you, I want to introduce um, Michael Rock, who really actually doesn't need very much introduction at all, um, because I'm sure many of you are aware of his studio and his, his body of work. Um, Michael is Michael is a founding partner and creative director of 2x4. He's, the profession, he's a professor of design at Yale School of Art as well as uh, here at Columbia GSAP and a visiting professor at Harvard GST. At 2x4, he leads a wide range of projects, both cultural and commercial, uh, for Nike, Prada, Miu Miu, Kanye West, Target, Hyundai, and many others. Previously, he was a fellow at Jan van Eyck Academy in Maastricht, the Netherlands, and contributing editor and graphic design journalist at ID Magazine in New York and I Magazine in London. His writing on design has appeared in publications worldwide, and he is currently a contributor to the New York Times T Magazine. He holds an AB in Humanities from Union College and an F, uh, MFA from Rhode Island School of Design. He's a recipient of 1999-2000 Rome Prize in Design from the American Academy in Rome and currently serves on the board of the Academy. His critically acclaimed collection of essays and projects, Multiple Signatures, was published by Rizzoli International in the spring of 2013. Welcome, Michael. So thank you. Uh, I know this is required, so I'll try to make it as entertaining for you as possible. Um, and thanks, Yoon Jae. Uh, Yoon Jae uh, worked in 2x4 for many years, and we miss her. So um, how do I advance with this? OK. Sorry, is it? Press that. OK, yeah. So um, I want. Uh, I'm, Called this talk in, on, around, and about um, because I think that in an architecture school, uh, the work that we've been doing is, in a way, always skirting the issue. And um, you could say that the title really is backwards because we started working on projects about architecture and kind of around the world of architecture, and then increasingly work that was in and on architecture, and then becoming inc increasingly structured. But I want to frame it in a slightly different way, which is to say that when I was like where you are now in 1982 as a graduate student in RISD, uh, I was working on these very basic uh, kinds of design pro projects. And I was interested at the time in this, um, this gap between meaning that happens from different perspectives and uh, in the idea of parallax and sort of how one image means something else. And, uh, and those were like the most primitive, low-fi kind of projects you can imagine. And then almost exactly 30 years later, I got this email from Kanye West inviting me to join him to design a theater for a seven-screen movie projection. And so what I want to talk about is what happened in that 30 years between there, because something changed, um, obviously, in the trajectory of our work but also in the trajectory of what does, uh, people thought of as graphic design and design itself. And so there was this, this transformation and trajectory um, where design went from one thing and then became something else. And, and we were basically kind of carried along in that transition. So in the very beginning of the studio 2x4 in New York in the early 90s, one of our first projects was this architecture magazine called Any Architecture in New York. And in a way, it was a perfect project for a studio which is just three people in a loft downtown. 
because basically they had no money and nobody read it, so you were kind of um, safe. And so we took it basically as just a studio project where, sorry, um, every, it came out every two or three months and we just set up a, a system for ourselves and forced ourselves to stay within this very uh, strict way of working. And it became really um, a kind of exercise and for us to figure out what we thought about design. And at the same time, the NE group, which is run out of Peter Eisman's office, was producing a yearly conference and a book. And so we had these two different projects, one the magazine that was ephemeral and then these books that came out every, um, uh, every year. And the book was another way for us to just basically establish a system and then play on that idea of a system. And so if you take a look, a look at, for instance, a single issue, this is any time, the, the book is structured around an idea of uh, an underlying grid, but then there's a modification to that grid that changes over the course of the book. And so you can start to see there's this motion that runs from left to right in the way that the book is animated. And when you think about a book as a kind of animation from you know, beginning to end, a very slow animation, but where, where there are ideas that are developed and ideas that change. And so it's really an exercise for the designer to create a system against which the game is played in terms of how design is played out. Um, the first project we did for any was the, called The Bigness of Rem Coolhouse, and it coincided with OMA's first show in New York at, at, uh, at MoMA. And through that relationship we developed with OMA, we started to do then a whole series of projects together. And that, that really became a defining feature of a lot of the things that we've done in the studio afterwards. And one of the projects is this unfinished work which we started years ago and still kind of chip away at, which is this huge book on Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria. And it started to set up a way, we started again thinking about that slow animation of the book, but in this case it was this decentered kind of uh, design process where every part of the book was its own piece and that would be developed simultaneously. And then the idea is that as the book develops you just make the stack of all the different parts. And so you have all these different fragments of content that ultimately end up to be a book and that you get this kind of cross section of all of these different books put together. And in doing that, we do all these studies, again, in the very abstract way about this idea of a book made of parts uh, that, that really represents um, many books all combined into one. And that idea of a book that has many different components, again, an anima a slow animation, but made up of these different uh, distinct uh, components plays out in many different projects we did. And one of them is another book we did with OMA, this book for Domus called Post Occupancy, which was, the idea was to look at architecture in a different way than it's normally pictured. And so typically what happens is a building is built and then you know, an hour before anyone goes into it, it's photographed in its most pristine state and that becomes the representation of it. And we wanted to look at the buildings actually in their least pristine state after they've been used and to represent them through unusual ways of thinking about representation of architecture. So one of the things we did, for instance, was look at the, how television news covered the opening of the building. And so to use the television camera as a kind of architectural photography and to see what kind of language the local press talked about the, um, the building itself. Or here, we looked at a single building but reflected in the buildings around it. So looking out from the building rather than into it. So kind of what you saw uh, of the building in the buildings that, that were its context. Um, here we collected all the images that tourists posted online of their visits to the building, so using the tourist as a photographer. Or here the images the building makes of itself, so through its own security apparatus, so using security camera as a, a kind of photography as well. So, so the whole book was an attempt to, to get at a different form of representation of architecture and to tell the story in this more complex way. Um, these are Ewan Bond's um, 360 photographs of some of the sites where you get this, uh, if you put a silver, the silver tube in the middle, it kind of recreates the space. And here we did photographic sections. So basically taking long and short sections to the building and then just moving through with the camera all the way through so you get a kind of way of slicing but a kind of photographic slicing through the building as well. And then, then that culminated in the book that Yunjay mentioned, Multiple Signatures, which is really, again, a book which is a series of different types of content. This is designed by Yunjay, as, as a matter of fact. But um, 
So that the idea is the book is coherent in the sense that it has some kind of consistent animation through it, but it has all these very distinct parts as well. So the book is made up of these um, individual components. And so that idea of pieces put together became a, a kind of predominant way we started to think about bookmaking. At the same time of all of that early work, um, you know, one of the things that you get pressed into a lot as a graph designer if you work for architects is to help them with uh, architectural pr presentations and proposals. And we did a lot of that with OMA in the very beginning and culminating in the development of AMO, which I was a, one of the founding partners of AMO, which was th th that this work that starts to frame architecture, was about architecture, became valuable in itself. And one of the early works was this um, piece that we did for um, the Universal Studios project in California that Omo was working on at the time. And it was this kind of urban idea of this continuous loop where you could enter into it, the, the site at any one of these six points. And so the book was basically a book which constantly rotated around. It had six different covers, and you could enter into the book at any different point. And you kind of, it didn't really matter where you began. You just ran through the book at uh, any point. And then another one of those projects with, uh, with OMA, too, was the, um, the project which was about the, uh, the MoMA competition, which was a huge project at the time in the early 90s. And at the time, instead of doing an, a really an architectural scheme for the, the project, what we decided was that we would make, we would, in the period of the competition, write and design a book, and the book would be the, the uh, entry to the competition, which we lost, so I guess it wasn't a good idea. But, um, but in part of that was we tried to go and show um, the, to, to make the process as visceral and as extreme as we could. And so, um, so parts of it would just go through these very clear step-by-step -step manipulations of the site. And so just photographing Cool House's hands, moving the model, and then with these kind of instructions that went along with it, presented the whole project as this very, uh, kind of almost a step-by-step uh, solution to the challenge. And then another project actually with a, a big group of architects, uh, again OMA, Toyo Ito, uh, Davis Bond Brody, a, other a kind of group in a competition for the UN City project. And here again we wanted to make this architectural story but in this most blunt way as possible. And um, Ram at the time said, think of Dick Bruna, you know, the guy who drew uh, Miffy, and that was like the, the language we were going for. And so the idea was to tell the story in this almost cartoon-like way and to take this really complex project with lots of different designers involved in it and simplify it down into its most basic uh, components. And one of, in, when we started that project, one of the annoying restrictions was that the book had to be 14 by 14 inches, which is a really annoying uh, dimension to work with. But uh, the one caveat was that it could have a fold out. You could have a fold out. So th we made the book as one continuous fold out that was about 25 feet long. So it just became this long continuous strip. And then you'd have this story that told, told it in this very basic way. And we also wanted to bring text in and the dialogue between the architects. And we did again that in a very si simple way. So you have uh, Cecil Bauman and Toyo Ito and Rem and kind of just recording their conversations and then using that conversation as part of the text of the book. So as I mentioned, that, that early work led to the formation of uh, AMO. And AMO, you, I'm sure you all know, was a, 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 it still is a think tank and a way to use architectural thinking to solve other kinds of problems. And one of the problems we first worked with was this uh, uh, project for Wired magazine. And after the tech bust in the early uh, 2000s, um, Wired was really thinking of, rethinking about what the mission of the magazine was, because at that point it had been a very uh, hyper-tech magazine. And um, so we did a whole series of studies on that, and one of them was this simple erasure and thinking that this is basically the ultimate cover of every Wired magazine, which is you can put any title and you say the blank is here and blank is history and you have another issue of Wired. Um, and so. We, we started off that project by simply counting every word ever published in Wired, and um, we found that after you removed all of the articles and prepositions, the most published word was new. And so this idea that Wired wasn't a magazine about technology so much, it was a magazine, a magazine about newness, and that allowed it to be free of technology and actually talk about many different subjects. We also looked at the use of the word revolution by issue, and you can see that every few issues there's this huge spike 
So it was a kind of magazine that was constantly trying to predict what the next revolution would be. So this, this kind of endless uh, repetition of permanent revolution. Um, so we devised these different ways of thinking about content generation through diagram. And so one of the things that we did was we started to track throughout different subjects when periods of newness happened. And it's, it's quite regular, for instance. So in entertainment, you have Christmas movies, and then you have the Oscars, and you have the summer movies, and you have this kind of very regular period when things come out. And with art, you have Art Basel, and you have Documenta, and you have these things. And so we found that there are these cycles of newness that could be overlapped. And if you basically overlap three cycles and see when they all reach the same peak, that that gives you an idea for an issue. And so if you think about newness in entertainment, technology, and art, that gives you a, an epi a episode of Wired. We also developed, continuing to work for Condé Nast, Wired's parent company, ideas for them uh, in thinking about magazine generation. And one of the things we developed was this cross breeding matrix where if you mate GQ and Architectural Digest, you get a new magazine called Bachelor Pad. Or if you mate Wired and Allure, you get Technocutie. So it was a way to imagine that you could generate new ideas from the things they had already. And then we did other things through that process of creating diagrams of, of analyzing problems. And one of the things we looked at here, for instance, was to take the idea of color as space and to analyze sort of who owned which parts of the color spectrum. And so this is called the battle for blue, because you can see that blue and red are highly prized properties, where there's lots of growth potential in green and pink. So that, all of that early um, kind of diagrammatic work started to lead to projects which started to become more realized. So one of the projects we worked with, again, with OMA was one of their first big American projects, which was the Student Center at IIT. And that project really started with a diagram, which was that you had the Mesian campus below the, the, where the elevated train is in the south side of Chicago. And above the um, track, you had all of the student housing. And then the site where the building would be was underneath the railroad track. That was the site chosen by OMA. And it was a, basically an empty lot that had these paths that had been worn in by the students, these desire lines over time. And so basically, we took that diagram, and that diagram became the plan of the building. And that ended up with this, uh, this amazingly uh, complex building um, at the, the campus. And working from the competition, we then transitioned from that work which was about architecture to starting to work in architecture. And so it was the first project where we were really working together where the work was, became part of the architectural space. And so if you know the building, um, it's underneath the train track. It works because you have this huge tube that silences the train when it goes over the building. So you're able to have a building underneath it where it wasn't viable before. And that building really is a whole series of these graphic interventions into the architectural space. So you, you, it's very transparent. You see into it. And the main entrance is this big portrait of Mies van der Rohe. And then the door is open, and you enter through his mouth. So you have it kind of swallowed by Mies as you enter into the building. And then inside, as you pass through, you can see there are these huge portraits of the founders of the university that are etched into the glass. And um, one of the things we did for that building was, because it was a student center, we developed this whole language of activity um, and all the different kinds of things that could happen in the, in the building. And the, the dean of students or the administration somehow pushed back and said that certain kind of activities couldn't be shown. So they set these uh, kind of series of, of rejected uh, activities. So you can still find them if you go look there hard enough. And the idea was to use those as the atoms for the whole building. And so you can see when you see these portraits close up, as you get closer to them, they're transparent in the glass, but they're actually made up of all those figures. So this kind of dissolution between the heroic image and these individual characters. And, but throughout the building, you have all these crazy things. There's one, the ballroom is, is wallpapered in this lenticular wallpaper, so it kind of moves as you walk. Um, part of the, those figures play out in these flocked wallpapers with kind of fuzzy places in the building. Um, and throughout, you can see that just like all these different kinds of surfaces that became really graphic surfaces that became uh, the overall tenor of the building, even you know, embedding in typography or clocks into the wall. Um, and, um, and about the same time as that was, we were finishing that, we continued on with OMA with this other project in Las Vegas, which was the Hermitage Guggenheim and the Guggenheim Las Vegas. And basically, these are two buildings in the, um, 
the, the Venetian casino, which you can see the fabulous Venetian casino around the edge. And the outside was this entirely Corten steel box that, that contained the Hermitage Guggenheim, which is basically pushed into the front of this more or less foam core building around the outside of it. And so you have this real contrast between the steel block and the kind of fake Venetian around it. And there for the outside, we, we rusted the surface of the, the Corten with the typography. So the typography rusts at a slightly different rate than the Corten. And so you get the typography always in a slightly changing relationship to the background. And then when you walk into the main Guggenheim Las Vegas, we had no section to work with there. So the entranceway is really a typographic ceiling where you walk under the typography and then into the space. And, um, and then the space becomes this kind of explosion where you go from the compressed area of the casino into this seven story high uh, open art space. And you can see that throughout the, there's these different kinds of interventions where in, this is a glass bridge where people from the um, parking garage are walking through the museum and into the casino. And they're basically in between the letters. They're walking behind the letters. Um, and you can see them pass behind it as, they, as they're walking through. And then you have these gigantic super graphics on the door. And even the ceiling there is printed with the Sistine Chapel. So you have um, a kind of Las Vegas version of uh, Rome, which is actually a retractable ce ceiling that opens up to the outer sky. So those projects then that, that went from about architecture to becoming in and on architecture continued with uh, here again with Oma in um, Dallas at the Dallas Theater. Um, a beautiful building that the entire facade is aluminum tubes. And at the bottom is, is, a gla is the glass uh, wall of the theater. And the, the typography is basically cut through the aluminum with light source inside it. So you have the typography kind of coming through the aluminum tube. And um, the way the, the theater works is that the, uh, the theater space actually is completely glass curtain wall. And you can see the aluminum tube comes down to here. And the notion is that when you come into the theater, you're in a glass space looking out at the city waiting for the show to start. And so the show starts when the curtain comes down rather than when the curtain comes up. And so there's mechanical blackout shades that completely cover those windows to make the black box of the theater. And so on the outside of that, we printed this curtain pattern, which is um, a very pixelated version of softness. And so you have this feeling of the hard facade and then the soft facade below it, though everything's flat in that case. So a kind of trompe l'oeil softness that happens in the relationship between the two facades. And then um, here with Frank Gehry in uh, Basel, Switzerland, this is, the head, this is the human resources building at the DeVartis company. And another building where the graphic really is something which is entirely in the architecture and part of the building itself. And so the building is a typical Gary complexity, but all the surfaces are treated in some ways, in different ways. And so we designed, for instance, even the, the air circulation vents that, are, that perforate all the panels um, with a system where it goes from a rational to an irrational system, so a kind of evaporation of the perforations. And this is where the air circulates through the wooden um, panels. Um, the glass there is, is treated these are interview rooms where you're not supposed to see who's being interviewed. So you have this kind of privacy uh, patterns which break up the possibility to see into the rooms. There's, uh, this is the restaurant with the kind of illuminated menu. And then there's a system so that the whole, the whole interior is more or less made out of MDF with a uh, Douglas fir veneer on it. And so we wanted to have information screens, but in a way that didn't feel like screens were in the building. So the, the wood is perforated from the back up into the level of the veneer, and there's LED behind it. So you have a sense of you can turn the wood on or off, and so the, the building becomes active in a way when you want it to be, and it could become typographic when you want it to be, but it's not uh, evident when it's turned off. So this way of the, the building becoming alive. And then, uh, we also dealt with the walls there where the cooling system in this building has uh, aluminum walls with cooling pipes behind them. And so we treat those walls with temperature sensitive materials. So 
when the cooling comes on, the walls change color. So you have this moment when the room goes from a yellow to an orange room, and you see basically the, the revealing of the, the Freon pipes behind the aluminum at that moment. So a way to kind of reveal the inner structure of the building out. And then recently, this is project's kind of ongoing right now, taking that, um, that sensibility of really weaving the architecture into the, uh, the uh, graph design into the architecture is the project we've been doing for, uh, with OMA for the Fenozio de Prada in Milan. And it's a beautiful site, uh, an old distillery that is half renovated and has half new buildings. And one of the first things we did was that we made the main identification of the building not at the building, it's actually across the street in a series of billboards that line the whole street that come to it. So, the, it kind of takes the identity away from the space and um, makes it part of the context. And then um, the building, the project itself, which is this combination of historic renovation, uh, new building, and then the gold building, which is taking an old building and in this case coating it with 24 karat gold, so you have a kind of transformational building also. And, um, and so everything throughout the space is really kind of tucked in or tries to feel as part of the surface as much as possible. So, we use white neon, uh, there's, there's text, illuminated text behind polycarbonate. The maps are basically built into the, the ground, so you have a kind of planned map that's part of the, uh, the space itself. And then parts of the facade open up and reveal screens behind it, so the, the mirrored facade of the theater opens up and you can see that there's an information screen that's hidden behind that. We also have you know, dynamic screens and analog together in orientation. And then these, these very simple um, uh, indicators of where you are. And oftentimes a part of this, a project like this is really about naming. So, you know, do you call the building one, two, three, four, or uh, how do you refer to different places? And part of the idea of this space was to give these buildings sometimes very natural names like North and South, but sometimes really strange names like Haunted House or Cistern. So they have like this a kind of weird mixture of uh, nomenclature. And uh, in continuing to work on this project, a lot of that work that ran in, started to run into designing exhibitions there. And we've, we've now for a long time designed many of the exhibitions for Fenoziano Prada in Venice. And when this space opened, we started to work on these as well. And this is an exhibition we did together with OMA called Ciro Classics. And it was about uh, Roman reproductions of missing Greek originals. So a lot of these sculptures, which now are iconically famous, were actually reproductions done in, in serial of, um, of missing uh, uh, Greek originals. And so it brings together all of these uh, groups of sculptures and shows them uh, at the same time. This is one of the first time you see a lot of these together. And, uh, and so you have this kind of funny thing which taking something which seems so iconic and you're seeing that uh, it's actually a reproduction. Uh, and so throughout the space there's all of these different ways that the graphic and the, the sculptural and the architecture work together. So you have a huge uh, floor um, of uh, marble that's elevated at different levels to make the plinths for the sculpture and then parts of the marble is taken away where you have metal forms and the metal forms show the shadow of the original Greek that's missing and then you have the relationship between the original and the and the copy. And, um, and then throughout also you have this typography on the floor that structures the whole uh, exhibition. And then, and then going down to the level of art labels. And then of course there's always like uh, some kind of digital component to that and you know it plays out through catalogs and through all the other things we make as well. So that work then starts to culminate in these really large scale projects, which again, the work is in the architecture and becomes also about the architecture. And here at CCTV in Beijing, um, the, you know, it's four and a half million square feet, so it's a huge um, project. And, uh, and when you work on a project like this, where we're really working on thinking of how people understand the space, it really comes down to a whole series of first diagramming and understanding even how do you call things, like is this one, t one building or two? Is it one tower or two towers? Especially in, since they join again in the middle, how do you direct people where they're going? And so it really became a conceptual project to figure out the semiotics of the building. 
and then that playing out into all the way, different ways that you understand where you're supposed to go and how you're supposed to circulate through it. And then starting to play that out into a graphic system that could unite all of these really extremely different kinds of spaces. So that includes thinking about a typographic system for the whole thing, but then also thinking about a material strategy for how those two things will relate. And then how we can take a very standardized graphic system and then iterate on it in all the different kinds of different places that we're going to have to work through it. And so it's really a, 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 when you work on a project like that, it's really a kind of big conceptual project and then you get down to this very minute problems of each space. And like one of the things we did was we designed all the canteens in the building and the, with these huge scale murals, they actually wrap through whole spaces, but they're just done with one by one inch tiles. So it's like this reinterpretation of the Chinese blue vase through bathroom tiles. So you have this kind of transformation of one to the other. And then that kind of culminates in the project we're working on now, which is the, all of the information design for Foster's um, ring building in Cupertino for Apple. And this building is about two and a half million square feet, uh, including all its ancillary projects. And this is an extremely complicated problem, semiotic problem again, like how do you tell people where they are when they're in a circle? And um, how do you move 12,000 people from all these different places into one site? And then when you have a big site with all of these different architectural things, like what, what's everything called and how do you know what it is? And one of the things we know is that if you don't basically name your building, someone will name it for you. And so it's not only what official names are, but can you control the vernacular around something? So for instance, this is being called the spaceship. We now call it the ring. We try to go and change the language around things. We named this thing Apple Park. That becomes the kind of the, the frame for this. And what's powerful about that is that when you start calling it something, then the audience will call it as well. So you have to get ahead of, of the, uh, the natural inclination to name things. And I can't show you a lot of this yet, but, uh, but you get into the design of language becoming a really important part of what our project is now. So thinking through how people interact with the space and how they'll understand it. So the, that work which comes about and in architecture then found like this special home in a whole series of projects we started to do together first at, together with OMA and then our own for Prada. And that uh, started off with this project in New York at the Broadway store where in the design for that space, there's this one huge uh, 200 foot long city, city block wide wall uh, that was left to be wallpapered. And um, wallpaper, of course, is like the cheapest and most least architectural material you can have. It's, you know, it's entirely surface, it's decorative, it's, uh, it's kind of forgettable in terms of an architectural form. But it allowed us to inject all this content into that space. And so that's been an ongoing, now 17 year project of putting all different kinds of things into that, that kind of tell different stories. And there's not really a uh, uh, brief for the project, it's really coming up with different ideas and how the ideas can kind of reinvigorate the space each time. So in this wall, for instance, you have all these people in a stadium holding up cards that make these big images. In this one, we imagined you know, what the mannequins do after work and they live in this kind of Edenic world. Uh, here we created an a alternate brand called the Gilt Corporation then, and the wall became its branding manual. Uh, here we did these huge portraits of women who were known for their power, not for their beauty. And then the second season, they were masked basically with these crazy floral masks. Uh, a wall where the background is actually textural and the foreground is flat. In this one, we um, commissioned 100 counterfeit old master paintings from an oil painting village in China. And the wall is actually the paintings themselves kind of layered onto the wall. Or here where the wall itself starts to undulate by a trompe l'oeil effect, like back like the Dallas Theater where you kind of soften the wall. Or here, one woman who's 200 feet long, so a kind of single, gigantic, sleeping uh, giant. So the, uh, it's really just an ongoing experimentation of scale, of flatness, of the relationship of theme to space, and the way that that, that 
each time something gets injected into the architecture, it really changes the nature of the architecture. And um, that's played out in all these different ways too, here with Harasaka and Demaran in Tokyo, where the imagery comes out of the building and then onto the surface. And then, um, thinking about that more active way too, so this is a project in Milan where we have seven different street artists to paint the interior of the show space. And the, the interesting stories about that is that about that is that you start off with a graphic project and that ends up part of the fashion project so this relationship between what happens on the walls and what happens on the collection and then the way that that then transforms into an accessory idea and then we bring it back to New York and it becomes a wallpaper paper idea and then to Dover Street Market where it becomes a, another idea and so you start off with one thing which was to invite these artists to do a project in the show space and then it grows into this really organic project with many different pieces to it. And then that also started initiating a, another side of the work, which is work which happens much more on screens. And that started really in New York at the Prada store with these three screen projects. And there we were just going and making anything we could because we knew how we, we were able to make it and just to make this content for the screens. But then, um, you know, it started to have other kinds of forms too. So one of the ideas in New York was to take the screens off the wall and just to hang them demurely between the clothing so you kind of come across the screens as you went through. And some of those had this quality where they became receptive, so they became mirrors in the store. So here the, um, the it's a mirror which actually obscures your identity, sort of like a Japanese porn fi filter. So you have basically the middle of the screen is pixelated and you only see what happens on the edge. Or in this screen, it's basically only recording a single line of pixels, and then as people walk by it, they're captured on the screen. So the screen is constantly capturing and collecting um, people's activities. And then um, we continued on with that screen-based work here um, in Beverly Hills, uh, developing a, a, a series of um, figures that are projected in the glass of that building. And the idea is that the bodies, each time they come to the surface, are actually made out of the latest news of the day. So they're run by an RSS feed. So you have this uh, kind of constantly regenerating bodies. And then we play with that body idea again here in Milan for these gigantic, these are gigantic projections for one of the fashion shows, where the body is a series of data points that are constantly growing and changing, but also collapsing too. So again, all of this meditation on the idea of fashion about the renovation or the newness of the body. And then a, a whole series of, you know, kind of constant iterations on fashion is multiplication, fashion is manufacturing, uh, you know, other ways to think about ways to break down the collection into its component parts. And here, um, how do I make that? I need to hit something to make that play. What do I do? Back and forward. You have to hit uh, the, on those ones, you have to hit uh, the click to make it play. Huh? Can you just click from the, uh, there's a few there might be like that, so. So here, going back to, to New York, and transfer, transfer, uh, transforming the whole staircase in that space to be a video screen. So the, the treads on the stair become video, and you have a sense of kind of animation of the space through the injection of um, the video into the, into the architecture. So that all of that different kind of crazy work that would be going on for Prada for many years kind of culminated in this big project we did called Pradosphere, which was to develop a architectural space in Harrods in London that would tell the story of this one uh, fashion brand. And so uh, it started off with a, a series of 40 windows on, along uh, Knightsbridge. And so you had kind of a, this narrative of window design. And 
the way that, that you can kind of presage the story as you go inside. And then the idea of Protosphere was to talk about the company not just as women's fashion, but in all the different kinds of activities it did. So there's a whole series of screens as you move through Harrods and you get up toward it. And then as you enter in, we, what we did was we designed basically the idea of a natural history museum of a fashion brand. And so to break it down to its components and to imagine that you could tell the story of how it came to be, what it makes, uh, what kind of forms it works in. And so we designed the space where when you walk out of, on the fourth floor, you walk out of the, the regular store and you pass this portal and then you get into this world which is totally immersive. And so we designed it as this kind of uh, uh, almost 19th century uh, museum with these huge cases. And what was interesting about this project was we did all the curation and we did all the architecture and we did the writing for it. We wrote the book and we animated all the videos. And so it was this really like 360 kind of design practice. And, um, and one of the things that we wanted to do was to tell the story not through sequential collections, the way fashion is often told, but really the way that you could look at one idea and you could see, like in this case, there's work which comes from 30 years of her career, but you see there's a real consistency to it over time. Uh, the evolution wall is this really, is like a 50 foot uh, timeline that tells all the different kind of art projects, the fashion projects and the other kinds of events that were happening. So you see the contextualization of the fashion through all the different activities that are happening. Um, we made these gigantic books to, to, to combine lots of different kinds of qualities. Um, here are the specimen cases, again, organizing things by theme rather than by time. And, um, and then the, the back wall was this huge, um, uh, single catwalk, uh, these, all these women are full height, and they're, it's all organized by color rather than time, and so what you see is that the work spreads, you know, again, 30 years, but you start to see there's a real consistency of aesthetic to it. So while fashion is basically about this idea of change from collection to collection, you can also see the voice of the designer because there's a way that she works over time, and so um, the notion was to really try to collapse all the work into one event. There's uh, digital components to that and uh, a big book and everything. And so it was really about kind of creating the whole frame for that to happen. And then some of these other projects that start to go blur between architecture, spatial design, exhibition, film altogether. This is a project we did in um, Tokyo. And uh, it was a fashion show in a, in a parking garage about a collection that was about driving. And so we started off where we created this whole roadside entrance and, and as you came into it and when you came into the parking garage there was this incredible kind of fantasy garage where we borrowed all of these amazing cars from uh, collectors in Tokyo and so the whole event happens in this kind of parking garage of your imagination and that outer walls of that are all surrounded by these point of view driving videos so you have a sense of almost looking through the walls as you pass through. So that sense of, of, you know, kind of looking through the dashboard of a car, or through the windshield of a car, and you're always looking out, and so it kind of breaks the, um, the, the Z dimension of the wall, and you're kind of looking through into the other spaces. And then the main space where the show happens, um, the show happens in one of the parking garage bays. We developed this film that played along with the shows, and the idea was to look at the problem of women and driving. And so... Um, What's interesting is that if you look at women in driving, there's always something happening. There's someone's escaping, someone's running away, some, something uh, uh, impending. And so we just have 500 clips, and it basically makes one drive through all these different pieces. Long, so it goes on and on. So um, uh, that they, we continued on with a whole series of these kind of spatial experiences, which were really about an event, uh, about mixture of art and a mixture of video and everything together. And so um, a lot of these things had uh, kind of 
club component to them or, or a party component to them than a fashion show or another event. And so it's really about mixing all of these things together. And in this one, um, a kind of launch for a project for Mew Mew, uh, we designed these special uh, powder rooms where you go into and the rooms, the walls were basically all animated in some ways. And so you took the basically like these combinations of old images and new images and then animated the walls. And so you have a sense of the, the whole space changing around you as you're walking through it. So a kind of real time collage work which is happening um, in space. And then um, finally in the, these, uh, well, I'm not sure it's finally, but uh, in these projects, um, here, a, a launch space uh, where the whole thing's designed between video and mirror. So it's a space about something which is for men and women, for perfume for men and women. And so the idea was to break down the visual space as much as possible. So when you went in, you have no idea of kind of what wall is what and what, uh, how they relate to each other. And so you have this kind of complete environment. You get immersed into the different parts of it. And uh, um, parts of these are, are playing on video and parts are playing, are, are uh, are mirrors of what's, uh, what's happening on the video. So you have this kind of strange relationship between the two. And then the idea is that the architecture is always dissolving away and becoming something else. And then uh, this recently from last fall, a space together with OMA in um, Milan, which uh, a huge fashion show space uh, made of metal. And here we worked on a project which was the uh, uh, a series of films designed together with David O. Russell, the filmmaker who made American Hustle. And the film is made to go and enter into the show space and play as a backdrop to that as well. Um, and so you have this kind of constant relationship between the film and the fashion on the screen. Can you hit, uh, click that to go? And so part of the story was to have this kind of suspense story that's playing on the backdrop of something which is like quite banal, like a fashion show. So the, between the relationship of the, the kind of story that's happening on the screen and then the story that's happening on the runway. And this, this film also was designed to play out certain ideas about between plot and narrative in the sense that uh, the, the actresses change all the time about who's playing the main role. And so you can follow the story of the... Uh, the story of the plot, even though that the, the characters within the plot change constantly. So, here I think it might need to click again. I can't remember. Let me see. Oh, it's already okay. This just shows you the, the relationship of the spaces. So, this is kind of strange relationship between the cinematic and the actual. So, um, yeah, so then we get back to this issue uh, with this email from Kanye and uh, this relationship of can you come up with an idea of seeing something simultaneously in all these different ways. And so um, Kanye had made this sketch and he said, I want to create a theater where you're totally immersed in this film. And so, of course, we could, sit, we could think about that through rendering and we start to think about that in the very technical ways of how you can see something. And uh, it becomes a real uh, problem just of viewing. Um, but one of the ways that we started to do that was to create a little version of that in the studio where we could set up with just projectors and start to really imagine how that would work. And that he could sit there and also decide sort of which parts would, how they would fit together. And, um, and then that starts to become modeled as a space. And, and then we went to the, you know, the interesting problem of the seven screens is that you have to design the space before you can design the film. So, um, the uh, the first thing we'd do is design where the cameras, uh, where the screens would be, and then design a, a, a rig camera rig that would film things that would, so it would match the architecture. So the architecture drives the filmmaking. So we went to Doha and made this film, and uh, made a rig, and then the camera can move, and then you also have to play playback device so you can see that as well. And then to uh, you know, kind of this crazy situation where you're in the middle of the desert in Doha and with a group of rappers making a film, and so somehow you're, you know, that that's become a possible project. And then th that needs a space as well. And so here we worked with Sho Shigematsu at uh, Oma, New York, and we went going from the idea of Rockefeller Records, that's the symbol, that became the structure to hold the theater that we designed in it. 
and then that became built at the Cannes Film Festival. So you have this relationship of a theater inside a pyramid that you enter in under the uh, under the edge and go up into the up into the inside to watch it. And so you have the sense of a, a, a highly, a really steep theater. You're completely surrounded by screens, and then the, the movie, basically the narrative of the film happens through all of these different devices. So I think I can, if you click there, could you? Interesting when you're working with seven screens is you're constantly you have to constantly turn on and off different parts of that to 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 focus people's attention. So this relationship between what you're looking at and how you use the the whole space versus individual parts of it. So you're able to kind of turn on or turn off the theater as you move through it. So. And then of course it has to work as Instagrammable moment too. So it has to be a kind of uh, recognizable icon at the end. So. That went on through then a series of other projects with Kanye designing these spaces, which were um, much more kind of traditional fashion shows. But here, the, for Yeezy One, a space where the models all were on stage already, and then no one moves. And then it only, it's only am, animated by the light overhead. So you have this kind of constant uh, kind of re-illumination of the, of the group of models through, through this one uh, screen, ceiling mounted screen. So that screen projects then have all these different manifestations. Here, um, we did a project for New York Design Week where we created a design manifesto that happened in Times Square. And so it was a device where you can still, anyone can uh, enter a three-word design manifesto. And um, they always have to have this uh, verb, uh, preposition, noun, um, uh, structure, and basically you create then through this crowdsourcing way this thousand line design manifesto and then that became part of this whole NYC design thing that played out in Times Square so to take all of that content and project it onto the screens of the city and um, give that a kind of animation and quality too so again this is a, a kind of different space about writing on architecture and that also then filtered through these um, 5,000 taxis through taxi TV too so to kind of see the screens as a distributed distribution technique I'll skip that. And then finally, the last project um, uh, is one we just finished uh, a couple weeks ago. And this is a project, again, that kind of combines all those things together. And this is a, a sustainability space for Hyundai Motor Companies in Beijing in 798. And it's an old uh, warehouse that we totally gutted and created this new space. And there's a whole series of interesting aspects to this, which is that part of the idea is that it's a space which purifies its own air. And so you can see that there's these walls which are thick that have plants in them and then this device overhead that has plants in it. And basically by using a solar chimney, we're sucking air through the plants and that purifies the air inside the building. Um, the outside of the building also has this uh, large scale mural on the outside and then you have this changing artwork on the outside and then as you enter in, you enter through this big air filter overhead and through this, uh, this plant wall, which is a plenum where air is coming through and then you kind of wrap into the space itself. So the outer wall is this huge uh, mural. This, this season is by the architectural drawings uh, studio in Beijing. And it's this really amazing uh, axonometric uh, imagination of 798 itself. And, um, and then as you enter inside, you can see overhead there's a screen and the screen goes from outside to inside and that basically is a graphic device that shows you the, how much particulate matter is taking out of the air. So you can see the transfer of the air from inside to outside, from outside to inside and the purification process that happens. And so you can see that happens overhead in this way where either we show that in a graphic way where you see actually see particles that represent uh, pollution or it's done in through typography, but you have this constantly changing ceiling. And then the space itself then goes through a library. It has a kind of living room area, uh, a cafe, and then you go upstairs. It is the, you can see the wall opens for the greenery. And then this is the air filter upstairs. So you can see the whole, all the process of the air filtering is exposed. So as it passes through all these different levels of filtering, it, you see below what's happening in the purification process. And then upstairs is a series of gallery spaces. One is a 
purely a video space where you can, we have these really large scale curving screens and the other is an art gallery space where we'll have changing exhibitions in there as well. So that's really kind of where it ends where this combination of the graphic, the mural, the digital, the spatial and the exhibition all come together as a final project. So I think that's it. Thank you. Um, I'll take just a couple of questions before we let Michael go. So raise your hand if you have questions. Um, in the meantime, I actually had a question for you, Michael, which is that even, even from the time I was at 2x4, you know, the, the studio has grown a lot and it's expanded its services and it's become much more sort of comprehensive um, in, the, you know, in the projects that, that it offers or, or uh, engages with. Um, so you have des not only graphic designers, but you have architects, you have strategists, writers, you know, historians, researchers, all these different kinds of people with different talents working at the studio. Um, what is it that since we're at an architecture school, what is it that you look for um, at 2x4 in a, in a spatial designer? Well, I think, you know, the people who come to work for us for architects are really not traditional architects in some ways. They're looking to work in a different field or they're kind of crossing out of the architecture because, you know, for us, our projects go much faster than an architecture project in the sense that we're done with a project in a year or sometimes less or a month. Um, and so the pace is entirely different than working on an architecture project. And so the people who come from us, to us usually are wanting to work outside of architecture. And oftentimes they come from different backgrounds too. Like they started off studying literature and then they became an architect or something. So they have these kind of very eclectic backgrounds too. But, you know, they want to, I think they, they're, they're looking to engage with architecture in a different way than normal. So, yeah. Questions? Okay, then we'll let Michael go. <laughs> Thank you so much.